Welcome everyone. I'm Dave Nicholson with the Cube. This is a special Cube conversation that is part of the AWS Startup Showcase, season two. We've got a very interesting conversation on deck with Steve Francis, who joins us from InstaCluster. Steve is the Chief Revenue Officer and Executive Vice President for Go-To-Market Operations for InstaCluster. Steve, welcome to the Cube. Thank you, Dave. Good to be here. Looks like you're on a uh, you're 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 coming to us from an exotic locale, or do you just like to uh, have a nautical just, theme in your office? <laughs> no, I'm actually on my boat. I have lots of kids at home, and uh, it can be very noisy. So uh, we call this our apartment in the city. And sometimes when we need a quiet place, this this does nicely. Well, fantastic. Well, let's let's talk about InstaCluster. Um, uh, first, give us give us a primer on InstaCluster and uh, and what you guys do, and then let's double click on that and go into some of the details. Sure. So InstaCluster, we offer a SaaS platform for data layer open source technologies. And what those technologies have in common is they scale massively. We, we curate technologies that are capable of massive scale. So people use them to solve big problems typically. And so in addition to SaaS offerings for those open source projects where people can provision themselves clusters in minutes, um, we also offer support for all of the technologies that we offer on our uh, SaaS platform. We offer our customer support contracts as well. And then we have a consulting team, a global consulting team who are expert in all of those open source projects that can help with implementations, that can help with design, health checks, uh, you name it. So it, most of what they do is kind of short-term expert engagements, but we've also done longer-term projects with them as well. So your business model is to be a SaaS provider as opposed to an alternative, which would be to uh, provide what's referred to as uh, open core software. Is that, is that right? Yeah, that's exactly right. So, we, so when, when our customers have an interest in using community open source, we're the right partner for them. And so you know, really what that means is if they, whether it's our SaaS platform, if, if they want the flexibility to say, we want to take that workload off of your SaaS platform, maybe at some point and operate it ourselves, because we're not throwing a bunch of proprietary, proprietary stuff in there, they have the flexibility to do that. So they always have an exit ramp without being locked in. And with our support customers, of course, it's very easy. What we support is both the open source project itself and if there's a gap in that open source project, what we'll do is rather than create a proprietary piece of software to close the gap, we'll source something from the community and we'll support that. Uh, or, if the, or if something does not exist in the community, in many cases, we'll write it ourselves and open source it and then, and then support it. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, supposedly Henry Ford made a comment once that if you ask customers what they want, they'll tell you they want a faster horse. Uh, but he was inventing the automobile and some people have, have likened open core to sort of the faster mechanical horse version of open source, where you're essentially substituting an old school legacy vendor for a new school vendor that's wrapping their own proprietary stuff around a delicious core of open source but yeah. it sort of diminishes the value proposition of open source. It sounds like that's that's the philosophy that you have adopted at this point. That's that's a I, I love that story. I hadn't heard that before. One that I like, uh, you know, matching metaphor for metaphor, uh, is uh, the um, <clears throat> is the luddites, right? You know, the luddites didn't want to lose their weaving jobs, and so they would smash weaving looms, and um, you know, to to protect their weaving jobs. And I think it's the same thing with the open core model. They're protecting, uh, you know, they're creating fear, uncertainty, and doubt about open open source, saying, "Oh, it isn't secure." And you know, the, those those arguments have been used for 15 years or 20 years. And you know, maybe 15 years ago there was some truth to it, but when you look at who is using open source, community open source now for huge projects. You know, if you just do a search for Apache Kafka users and go to the Apache uh, Apache website, you know, it's kind of the who's who in big business. And these are people using community open source. And so um, a lot of the fear and uncertainty and doubt is still used. And it's just, 
you know, it's just kind of hanging on to a business model that isn't really, it's for the benefit of the, of the vendor and not the benefit of the customer. Well, so I can imagine being a customer and realizing several years into an open core journey that I basically painted myself into a similar corner that I was in before. Um, and so I can see where that, you know, that can be something that is a realization that, that creeps up over time from a customer perspective. But from your business model perspective, um, if I'm understanding correctly, your, when you scale, you're scaling the ability to um, take over operations for a customer. Uh, yep. That at some level, I'm sure you've got automation involved in this, uh, but at some level you've got to scale in terms of really smart people. Um, yep. Has that limited your ability to scale? So first talk about what, what have the results been? You guys, have, we've been covering you since 2018. What have your results been over time? And, and has that sort of limited, that, that limit to your scalability uh, been an issue at all? It's hard to find people. Uh, it's, hard, it's hard for our customers to find people and it's hard for us to find people. So we have an advantage for two reasons. Number one, we have a really good process for hiring people, hiring graduates, recent computer science graduates typically, and then getting them trained up and productive on our platform and within a pretty short time frame of three or four months. And, um, you know, so we, we've, we've a, we have a really well-proven process to do that. And then the other thing that you've already alluded to is automation, right? There's a ton of automation built into our platform. So we have a big cost advantage over our customers. So, you know, our, our customers, you know, if they want to go hire a seasoned, you know, Kafka person or Postgres person or Cassandra person, these people are incredibly expensive in the market. But for us, we can get those people for relatively less expensive. And then with the automation that we have built into our platform to do all the operational tasks and handle all the operational burdens on those different open source projects, it's a lot of it's automated. And so, uh, you, you know, where one of our experts can use, you know, the number of workloads that they can operate is usually, you know, many times more than what someone could do without all the operational capability or all the uh, automated capabilities that we have. So what has your, what is your plan for scaling the business look like into the future? Is it uh, additional investment in those core operators? Uh, are you looking at, uh, uh, expansion geographically, uh, acquisition. What what can you share with us? You know, we've done some acquisition. We added a Postgres capability. We recently added a, last, a, a further Elasticsearch capability and really buttressed our capabilities there. Uh, I think we'll do more of that. And um, we we will continue to add technologies that we find interesting and, and fit our model. Usually what we look for are technologies that are pretty popular they're used to solve big problems and they're complicated to manage, right? If something's easy to manage, people are not likely to perceive our value to be that great. So we look for things that, um, you know, are, are, we kind of take the biggest, hairiest, gnarliest um, open source projects for people to manage and we, we handle the heavy lifting. Well, can you give me an example of something like that? You don't have to, you don't have to share a customer name if you don't, if it's not appropriate, but give us a, give us an example of, of InstaCluster in action. Pretend I'm the customer, and uh, and uh, you know you mentioned Elasticsearch. Let's say that yeah. let's say yeah. that that is absolutely something that's involved, and I have a choice between some open open core solution and throwing my people at it to manage it uh, and, and and operate at the data layer uh, versus what you would do. What what does that interaction look like? How do you, how does the process yeah. so, look? When so you take that's over? a I, I'm. So one thing that we hear from Elasticsearch customers a lot is uh, their customers, some of them are unhappy. And what they'll tell us is, look, when we get an operational problem with Elasticsearch, we go to Elasticsearch and the answer we get from them is, you got to buy, you know, you got to buy more stuff. You got to add more nodes. And they're in the business of, uh, you know, that's, that's their business. And uh, sure, you know, they do have a SaaS offering, but, um, you know, they're, they're also in the business of selling software. And so, when those customer, those same customers come to us, our answer is often, well, hey, we can help you optimize your environment. And, you know, a lot of times when we onboard people onto our platform, they'll achieve cost savings because maybe they were on the cloud, maybe they weren't completely optimized there. And, um, 
you know, we want to make sure that they get a good operational experience. And that's how we kind of lock customers in, right? We don't lock them in with code. We make sure that they have a positive experience, that we take a lot of that operational stuff off their hands. And so there's just a good natural alignment between what we want to provide that customer and what they ultimately want to consume. Uh, you know, that, that alignment, I think, is, is uniquely high within our business. Well, so how, how have things changed just in the last several years? Obviously, I mean, you know, the, the pandemic has, has affected everything in, in, yep. in one way or another, but, but in terms of things that live at the data layer being important, um, I mean, just in the last three or four years, the talk of various uh, messaging interfaces and databases has shifted to a degree. Um, what do you see on the horizon What's get, what's 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 getting buzz that maybe didn't get buzz a year ago? What 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 are you looking for? Is well, if you're out looking for people with skill sets right now, what are those skill sets you're hiring to? I don't hire engineers, right? I run the go-to-market organization. I hire marketers, salespeople, consultants, but uh, so it's probably different. I, I'm maybe not the best person to ask from an engineering standpoint. But uh, your question about the data layer um, and how you know, that's evolving and trends that we see, it's becoming increasingly strategic. You know, ever there's a couple buzzwords out there that, you know, for years now, people have been talking about um, modernization, digital transformation, stuff like that. But, you know, there's, there's a lot to it, like digital, you know, every business kind of needs to become a, a digital business. And as that happens, the amount of data that's produced is, is just is mushrooming, right? You know, the amount of data on the planet doubles about every two years. And so for a lot of applications, for a lot of enterprise mission critical applications, data is the most expensive layer of the application. You know, much more expensive than delivering a front end, much more expensive than delivering a middle tier. When you've, you know, just, when you factor in storage, um, uh, just the, the kind of moving data in and out, you know, data transfer fees, the cost of engineering resources, the, it's, it's, an, it's incredibly expensive. So data layers are becoming strategic because organizations are looking at it and realizing, you know, the, the amount that they're spending on this is, is eye popping. And so that's why it's becoming strategic. It's on the radar just due, due to the, uh, the size of bills that organizations are looking at. Um, and we could drive those bills down. You know, our value proposition is really simpler. It's a better, faster, cheaper, and we eliminate the license fees. We can, you know, we are operational experts, so we can get people architected in the cloud more efficiently. And probably about a third of the time, we save our customers cloud fees. Um, so it's, you know, it's a pretty simple model. But some of those things that are strategically more, or they're sorry, traditionally more tactical, are becoming strategic just because of the scope and scale of them. We, uh, we're having this conversation as part of the AWS startup showcase, which basically means that AWS said, hey, Silicon Angle, uh, have your cube guys go talk to these people because we think they're cool. So um, so why, why, why do they think you're cool? Are you a wholly owned subsidiary of AWS? Did you, did you and your family uh, uh, exceed the 300 order uh, Amazon threshold last year? Why, uh, what's yeah. your relationship with I Amazon? Elf, I bought an elf on the shelf from, uh, yeah. from I, know, I don't know, I don't know why. Um, <laughs> you know, we're, we're growing fast and we're, we're growing north of 50% last year in 21 and closer to 60%. Um, you know, we certainly, I think, uh, when our customers sign up for our services, it, you know, Amazon gets more workloads. That's, that's probably, you know, a positive thing for Amazon. Um, we're certainly not, you know, there's much, much, much bigger vendors than uh, partners than us that they have, but, uh, but, you know, they're, I think they're aware that there's, there's some, some of the smaller vendors like us will grow up to be, you know, the, you know, the bigger vendors of tomorrow. Um, but they've kind of, they've been a great partner. You know, we, we support multiple, we do support multiple clouds and Amazon's cool with that. You know, we support GCP, we support Azure and kind of give our customers the choice of what clouds they want to run on. Uh, most of our customers do run an Amazon. That seems to be sort of the de facto standard, but um, yeah, they've been a great partner. But but AWS, it's not a dependency. Uh, if you're if you're working with InstaCluster, it doesn't mean that you must be in AWS. No, we can support customers. Uh, that's a great question. So we can support customers in, in multiple clouds. 
And we even support them on-prem, right? If they, if organizations that have their own data center, we actually have an on-premise managed service offering. And yep. if that's not a fit, we even have, um, we can offer support contracts. Like if, if they want to do it themselves and do a lot of the heavy lifting and just need sort of a red phone for emergency situations, uh, we offer 24 by 7, 365 support with 20 minute service levels for urgent issues. So your chief revenue officer, that means that you write the code that runs operations in your system. I'm not smiling, but I'm at, but I'm, but I am actually joking. Sorry yes. for the dry yes. sense of humor. Uh, but 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 seriously, let's talk about the business end of this, right? Yeah. You know, we, we have a we have a lot of folks who uh, who tune into the cube because of the technology aspect of it. But let's talk about your your growth trajectory over time. Um, uh, this isn't a drill down. I'm not asking for your your pipeline, Steve. But yeah. Uh, yeah. but but you know, give, give us an idea of what that trajectory has looked like. Um, what's going on from that? Yeah, I mean, most recent year, you know, we're we're getting uh, to be. Um, I, don't, I don't know what I'm permitted to share. Expect, but I, I we're, you know, we've we've had a lot of growth. You know, I've, we've grown a couple a couple hundred percent. Our revenue has in the amount of time that I've been here, which is three years, and we're at the point now where we're pretty good size, uh, and that gives us. Uh, it's cool. It's exciting. You know, we're what we're noticing in the market is people who two years ago people no one knew who we were, and now we're beginning to talk to some partners some resellers, some customers, and they will say things like, oh yeah, we've heard of you. We didn't know what you did, but we've heard of you. And you know, that's that's fun. That's a great place to be. Uh, you know, it becomes a little bit self-sustaining at that point. And um, we, you know, we are about to launch. I, it's not a secret because this is in public preview. So I think- I noticed the pause there. I noticed the pause where you're like, can I say this or not? Go yeah. ahead and say it, Steve. <laughs> Yeah, Go ahead and say it. we we uh, I was trying to think. Wait, am I revealing anything here? I shouldn't, but uh, we did just go public preview, uh, probably a month ago with a project called Cadence, uh, Cadence Workflow. Uh, you can actually um, go to the Insta Cluster website and look up Cadence. Um, it's right on our homepage, or you can, if you want to go to the open source project itself, you can go to cadenceworkflow.io. Uh, this is a project that's trending pretty highly on Google. It's got a lot of important movers in the technology business that are using it and having a lot of success with it. Uh, and we're going to be first to market globally with a SaaS offering for Cadence Workflow. And um, it's an incredibly exciting project. And it's exciting for us too, specifically because it's a little different, right? It's not, it's a middle tier project It's that is targeted at developers to increase developer productivity and developer velocity. Um, you joked about my being a CRO writing code, but I actually used to be a coder a long time ago. I was not very good at it, but what I, I did enough of it to remember that uh, a lot of what I did as a coder was write plumbing code. You know, rather than writing that code that makes the business application function, a huge amount of my time as a developer was spent writing, you know, just the plumbing code to make things work and to make it secure and to make it transactional and just all that, you know, kind of nitty gritty code that you got to do. In a nutshell, Cadence makes writing that code way easier. So especially for distributed applications that have workflow-like capabilities, requirements, uh, it's a massive productivity in, in, uh, increaser. So what's cool, exciting for us is now we can, rather than just target data operators, we can actually target developers and engage not just at the data layer, but kind of at that middle tier as well and begin to uh, identify and, and um, uh, synergies between the different uh, services that that we have and and our customers will obviously benefit from that. So that's a so big part of our growth strategy. Yeah. So more more on from a business perspective and a go to market perspective. Um, what is your what is your go to market strategy or uh, do you have, do you have a channel strategy? Are you working with partners? You're going out directly. Our channel strategy is pretty nascent. You know, our go-to-market strategy, for the most part, has been, you know, we uh, pay the Google gods, and and lots of people come to our website and say they want to talk to us. You know, we talk to them and we get them signed up with a uh, on our, our our SaaS platform or with a support contract or with our consulting team. Um, we also do outbound. You know, we do. We have an inside sales team that does outbound prospecting, and we have. Um, and we also have some self-service. We have some, some self-service customers 
as well. That just, you know, anyone can go to our website, swipe a credit card, sign up for one, for our SaaS offering and begin literally get fired up in minutes and, and, and using the platform. Uh, so, you know, it's a bit of a mix of high touch, low touch. I think our, you know, we have tons of big logos, you know, lots and lots of our customers are household name, really big organizations, solving big problems. And um, that's kind of where the, the bulk of our business is. And so I think we've been a little more focused there in go to market than we have sort of the, you know, startup selling to startups and the people that just are super developer focused, wanting low touch. So, but I think we need to do better at that part of the market. And uh, we are investing some resources there. So, that, you know, we're not so lopsided at the high end of the market. We want kind of the, more of a balanced approach because, you know, some of those, some of those um, younger companies are going to grow up to be big, massively successful companies. We've had that, you know, DoorDash is a, has been a customer of ours for years and they were not nearly, you know, we, they were a pre pan they were a customer of ours pre pandemic and we all know what happened to them uh, during the pandemic. And so, you know, we know there's other DoorDashes out there. Yeah. Yeah. Now, uh, uh, final question, geography, uh, you guys global. I, uh, you, I know you're in North America, but, uh, yeah. what, what, what does that look like for you? Where are you? Yeah, are you we're super global. global. So, you know, in my go to market organization, we have sellers in, um, uh, Asia pack in Europe, you know, multiple in Asia pack, multiple in Europe, uh, you know, lots and lots in the, in the States, uh, same with marketing, uh, same with engineering, same with our tech ops delivery team. We have most of them uh, in Australia, which is where we were founded. Uh, but we also have a pretty good sized team uh, out of Boston and um, kind of a nascent team uh, in, in India as well to help to tell to help them out. So yeah, very much global, and um, you know, getting close to 300 employees. Um, you know, when I started, I think we were about 85 to 90. That's, a, that, that's an exciting growth trajectory. And uh, I'm just going to assume, because it just feels awesome to assume it, that since you're on a boat and since you were uh, founded in Australia, that that's how you go back and forth to uh, to visit the Australia. Yeah. <laughs> so I want to say- It takes a while. It takes a while. <laughs> so with that, Steve, I want to say uh, smooth sailing and, Thank uh, and uh, thanks for joining us here on theCUBE. I'm Dave Nicholson. Uh, this has been part of the AWS Startup Showcase, my conversation with Steve Francis of InstaCluster. Again, thanks, Steve. Stay tuned. Thanks very much, Dave. You, your source for hybrid tech coverage.